Um, I, I decided to break this presentation into five parts to try and cover three different projects. One that was my dissertation research, which is more or less completed at the time, at the moment. Um, a service learning course that I'm in the process of completing this semester with students in relation to a local settlement house on the Upper West Side. Um, and then an emerging comparative ethnography that I'm doing also on Manhattan's Upper West Side or Midtown West as well as Upper West Side. Um, and then end with this idea of asking what a courageous urban platform might look like as opposed to a smart urban platform. Um, so to get started um, with the first chapter, I want to kind of use this moment of articulating what I mean by the urban platform and situating it as what Neil Smith has previously referred to as the new urban frontier. Right? When Neil Smith coined that term and wrote the book, The New Urban Frontier, he was talking primarily about gentrification here in New York City during the 90s in a very non-technological way, but I think it's extremely applicable if we look at how neighborhoods are changing and especially who gets to belong and not belong in this kind of smart city that's coming about. So I want to start with this concept of the urban platform and trying to see it as a new kind of frontier, which is, of course, loaded with all kinds of colonialist metaphors and language. Um, so this is an ad from one of IBM's websites dedicated to their smart urban initiative. And I pull it up here because I find it rather representative to how we're often sold these ideas about what the smart city is supposed to do. And one of the most important things it's supposed to do for us is reduce costs and improve efficiency. Efficiency seems to be the name of the game, at least for the rhetoric surrounding how they're trying to justify and sell these sort of smart urban products. So while smart urbanism broadly represents multiple and often contradictory uh, movements, I would argue that it's loosely organized by a neoliberal ontology of efficiency or an articulated desire to harness big data and technological innovation for the purposes of orienting the urban everyday towards maximum economic and social production. Uh, there's generally two kinds. One would be more of bottom-up building of a smart city, and another would be retrofitting an existing city um, like New York, or in this case, Boston. Um, I'm also particularly interested by Bloomberg's reign as mayor here in New York City, a kind of data-driven urbanism that he implemented through his policies and the way this is being uh, exported to other cities across the U.S. through the What Works Cities program that he put together. Um, what Works Cities is supposed to spend around $42 million on 100 mid-sized cities um, to try and get them to adopt data-driven policies similar to the ones that Bloomberg put in place here in New York City. Um, and this is a quote from an op-ed that he wrote in the Huffington Post at the launch of this new initiative. And he said, how can cities rise to meet big new challenges and, sever and serve more and more people with resources that are always stretched thin? by finding smart ways to use a resource that is always growing, data. And I think it's a very important quote because it starts to frame data as a natural resource that can be tapped, can be withdrawn from the environment, and that is seemingly endless, and thus a sort of quick solution to larger problems. Um, I also find the setup of this particular problematic, the particular um, initiative problematic in terms of how it does not reach out to local people in communities that will kind of de uh, receive the bulk of what these new policies are meant to do or these new programs. If you go to the website, you will see that the very first step for participating in What Works City is to commit from the top, right? The complete antithesis of bottom-up planning. And it asks, are you the mayor, city manager, chief of staff, or key city decision maker? If so, and you're committed to what works, move ahead. If you are not, this website has very little to offer you, and thus the initiative is not looking to involve you, at least at the initiative, at the beginning stages. Um, going through more of their materials, you'll also see things that goals are clearly defined by what they call mayors and leaders, right? Uh, to collaborate, the only place where that word appears in this initiative seems to suggest that collaboration means building buy-in and using data. Right, which is a very interesting kind of framing of what collaboration means when decisions have been made and your goal is to build buy-in around those decisions that have been made without public input. Um, we can also look at the way the economy itself is increasingly reorienting towards high-tech industry um, and creative labor. 
sorry, creative industries. This is a map put out by digital.nyc forward slash map. Um, put out by the city itself, and it tries to map the various startups, events, uh, incubators, investors, workspaces, and so forth that exist throughout the city. And naturally, you see a very, very high concentration among rather affluent, new, uh, rather affluent neighborhoods in the Manhattan area. Very little as you move up to the Bronx, out into Brooklyn, away from the coast, or into places like Queens or Staten Island. So while this economy is being pitched as a solution and transformation for the overall city, it's primarily concentrated in just a few geographical areas of the city itself. Um, and this notion of the smart city, although uh, maybe a few years ago we would have called it the cyber city, or before that Manuel Castells was talking about the informational city, the concept goes back a few decades now. Um, but it goes back even further in the more general sense if we are less fascinated by the digital aspects of this new manifestation. And this is Henri Lefebvre in 1970 uh, talking about what he calls the urban form itself. And he says, the ur in the urban, everything is calculable, quantifiable, programmable, everything that is except the drama that results from the co-presence and representation of the elements calculated, quantified, and programmed. And I think this is often what gets lost in a lot of the discourse and discussion about what these new smart urban policies are supposed to do, um, because it tries to smooth over this drama instead of really embrace it and understand it as the thing that we need to be focusing on. And obviously, as I mentioned previously, um, this suggests a certain kind of new frontier ideology or imaginary for the city in which it can be remade for an incoming class of workers, industry, students, and it sort of renders the locals, those that, it, that inhabited the city previously, as unworthy, uh, unaware of the value that they had, uh, and thus not relevant in this new reconfiguration of the city. So the top here, I have a picture of um, resistance going on to gentrification in the early 90s on the Lower East Side, in which renters were being priced out of um, new neighbor their neighborhood based on new real estate investment. And on the bottom is a horribly pixelated picture that I got off Google Images um, on a lot of the protests ongoing with Google's use of private buses in San Francisco at the moment, using public infrastructure, um, public streets, and yet private transportation to shuttle inner city workers to the corporate campuses outside of the city. And by no means is Google the only one involved in that, but that it becomes another flashpoint of who gets access to the city and who is imagined as a settler in this new frontier and who's imagined as the population that's being erased. Right. Um, so I see this as a continuation of the urban front, sorry, the urban frontier mythology and the revanchist underpinnings of the gentrification of Manhattan's Lower East Side that was documented by Neil Smith in the 1990s. This wave of gentrification, especially one at the top, um, was framed as a middle class colonization of a modern day Wild West, an imagined reestablishment of white, middle, and upper class values into the social material organization of urban life itself. Um, I'm also particularly struck by words like innovation and disruption, which I would imagine most of us are getting tired of at this point because they virtually lost all meaning. Um, yet the meaning I, in the past, these terms, at least in my mind, would have simply been called creative destruction. Now we use buzzwords like innovation and disruption. And for those not familiar with creative destruction, uh, David Harvey talks about in the New Imperialism, he says, capital necessarily creates a physical landscape in its own image at one point in time, only to have to destroy it at some later point in time uh, as it pursues geographical expansions and temporal displacements as solutions to the crises of overaccumulation to which it is regularly prone. Right, so over here, this is a picture of the uh, Cross Bronx Expressway that Robert Moses built, and you can see it just marching through the Bronx itself, destroying neighborhood after neighborhood in a very clear, clean line. Um, and Moses, who was at the time the head of the Port Authority, did not have to answer electorally for these kinds of decisions or um, design making that was going on, and thus never really held accountable um, by the people who were displaced most by the destruction of this creation. Right. And so I see this similar kind of creative destruction carrying on in the smart city, but sort of framed in this innovative, disruptive kind of way. Um, it smooths over the destructive aspects. 
Uh, Olivier Sylvia, in, in an excellent uh, essay recently published called Network Equality, um, he writes about this issue of innovation and what exactly does it mean as we think about the configuration of our cities and ourselves. He says, to the extent that net neutrality addresses the distributional goals of communications law, it posits that, op that openness will foster innovation, which in turn will draw user interest, which in turn will induce investment in more and better infrastructure, which in turn will benefit today's undeserved. This is the trickle-down theory of internet innovation, right? And so very uh, often I see this discussion of innovation focusing on the creativity it might create for a relatively small group of people within the city or society at large, and assuming that somehow that sort of special access and ability to innovate will trickle down and benefit everyone below them, which I hope you can hear my skepticism, I do not think uh, is likely to happen. Um, so to go back to uh, Lefebvre um, and to sort of overlay it with this picture that I showed earlier, um, Lefebvre's also argued that the everyday constitute, constitutes the platform upon which the bureaucratic society of controlled consumerism is erected. That it's about both the production of space as well as the social and cultural practices that are going to sustain and reproduce a society with particular interests and particular goals. And so in this light, um, what is new about the platform that in this case Lefebvre was talking about in the 70s is that the platform itself is now proprietary, right? There is ownership over this platform, ownership over the city in a way that is more closely aligned with the property models of digital media instead of the existing property models of physical space. Um, capitalist property regimes are increasingly utilized to produce both space as well as knowledge. Um, and this points to the importance of understanding how the proprietary aspects of this urban platform mediate everyday life and reproduce both the material and social environment. Um, in my own work, I've tried to theorize this uh, trend as proprietary ecologies. Um, and I call the proprietary ecologies multi-dimensional ecosystems of privatized data flows within which everyday life increasingly takes place. The concept bridges an IT discourse of information systems with uh, systems that interact at various scales, i.e. information ecology, with a spatial understanding of the relations of production and reproduction at various scales, i.e. political ecology. So with this in mind thinking about political ecologies, we can, sorry, proprietary ecologies, we can see how privatization is happening both online and offline at various scales from the intimate to the global, right? Some kind of notable examples would be uh, at the, the highest scale we might imagine, Google's new initiative with Project Loon to launch these hot air balloons into the sky that will beam down quote unquote, free Wi-Fi to various parts of the world that are currently not wired, right? Facebook has similarly done the same. Initially, it was called internet.org. Now, I believe it's called Internet Basics. Facebook's uh, approach is slightly different. They purchased a drone company with, that produces solar-powered drones so that these drones can stay in the air for extended periods of time and sort of beam down Wi-Fi. Um, and so this is very much kind of privatizing internet access at the highest scale we might imagine, literally. Um, and yet it comes back down to how the bodies who receive this internet uh, get framed as well. This is an ad which I believe no longer exists on the internet. I took it from internet.org's website. Um, and in this particular ad, we see how young people specifically start to become framed as both a spectacle as well as a resource. Um, in this case, it's Erica and Esmeralda in Bolivia. Um, to kind of briefly summarize what the ad is saying and doing in relation to them, they're talking about these two young women in Bolivia who are able to use industrial waste and turn it into a robotic arm. Right? So literally taking the waste of industrial capitalism and figuring out how to be creative and productive with it to build a biological arm. And the phrasing of this whole advertisement is, 
And that's just two people. Now imagine connecting all of the world's unconnected 45 billion people, get them online, and who knows what we will do. There is a subtle suggestion that these people have knowledge that we need for our improvement, a sort of extraction of indigenous knowledge instead of an affirmation that they were able to do this without internet. Imagine what they could do with more internet instead of the other way around. So it's seeing this as more of a resource, which I think speaks to the idea that whether we're talking about internet basics or Project Loon or what I'll get to in a moment with Link NYC, most of these are instances in which they are no fee. They need to generate revenue somehow that is usually through data. So it is a process about extracting value from individuals instead of providing value to individuals. Um, another case which was very, um, it's popped up at South by Southwest as a PR strategy by a company based here in New York City was the idea of homeless hotspots. Um, this, of course, went off the rails pretty quickly as to why it was problematic to strap Wi-Fi devices to homeless people and ask them to walk around South by Southwest to receive donations in exchange for Wi-Fi access. Now, the idea behind it in defense of BBH Labs who put this together, they said that we saw it as a means to raise awareness by giving homeless people with a way to engage with mainstream society and talk to people. The hotspot is a way for them to tell their story. And along these lines, they were trying to pick up the idea of um, homeless newspapers, newspapers that would be produced, narrated, created, managed by homeless populations, and then sold on the street to raise money. So it was actually a way of generating revenue for homeless people, as well as articulating their story to the public. In this case, the homeless people had no ability to narrate their own story, to control the kind of uh, relationship they were having with passersby or people in the local area. And in fact, there was no need at all to even talk to these people. They were moving human infrastructure that you could obtain Wi-Fi from and give a donation to were you interested. Um, and again, I, I bring this example up particularly because this is the kind of thing we often refer to as public Wi-Fi. And I'm, I'm still lost as to what in any of the past three examples is public here. Um, slightly different than the past three, in part because it follows a privately owned public model, right? In New York City, we have lots of examples of privately owned public spaces private spaces that are privately managed but receive public funds to provide a public service, right? It's very similar to the legal model that we're following with the Link NYC projects, uh, Link NYC kiosks that are popping up throughout the city. Similarly, the city is supposed to make, they're arguing, roughly $500 million annually, and it will cost them nothing to do this project, which, you know, sounds great for a lot of reasons because we have these things hanging around the city, which it, for... In most cases, they are public urinals now. I mean, this is, there are very unusual uses that we see with most payphones that do exist, if there is even a ringtone. Of course, there are problems that lie with building a public Wi-Fi system dependent on raising advertising revenue um, to pay for its operating expenses. Um, we can think about this as the Zuccotti Park of internet access, right? Who gets these spaces, who gets these kiosks are going to be areas with the most foot traffic that is going to be most valuable to advertisers, right? It is not going to go into areas like public housing projects, at least not in the first or second wave of putting these into place. And in addition, the terms of use policy that governs the Wi-Fi that the city will become dependent on is going to be able to be changed at any point in time without public intervention or public access, right? This is precisely what led to the eviction of Occupy Wall Street from Zuccotti Park down in Wall Street, um, was that the terms of use of the park was changed by Brookfield Properties, which then allowed for the eviction of people who were staying there, right? It was not that they suddenly did something that became illegal, it's that the terms of their participation was changed during the occupation, which of course nothing prevents that from happening with this ongoing use of privately funded Wi-Fi. Okay. So giving that as a lot of kind of far-ranging context and trying to now focus a lot of those ideas on three specific projects that are going on. I want to talk about this notion of canaries in the data mine. This is the term I use or the metaphor I use to frame young urban youth's relationship to each other and to the city. Um, youth are the canaries in our contemporary data mine. Their situated resilience, distress, empathy, and apathy are indicators of things to come. Um, 
I like the idea of kind of canary in the coal mine, um, although there is something obviously very negative and morbid about the idea of the canary in the coal, line, coal mine. I still find it better than these ideas of digital natives right, or other kinds of rhetoric that we typically use in relation to young people. Um, youth experience our data-driven society first and foremost, absent any embodied understanding of what privacy or property may have meant prior to ubiquitous con connectivity. Their sensitivity to environmental change places them in a position of power and not risk if we are to pay attention to them, right, to like take note of what these canaries are chirping about and what they're reacting to. Um, so my dissertation project, which was called MyDigitalFootprint.org, I tried to look at young people in this dual frame. One, as an emerging kind of informational ideal, and I'm using informational in a very specific way that Manuel Castells uses the term to evoke industrialism, right? That it's both information itself as well as the cultural practices around it. So how young people emerge as informational ideals as well as young people as informational property, something that can be owned, something that can be controlled, something that can be regulated through capitalist property regimes. Um, these are just some examples of ads that I found over the years. W on the right is a trade advertisement by Oxygen Network, the slogan being, in advertising, all women are not created equal. And if you can't make out what the small type is, it's essentially saying our viewers are younger women with lots of money who spend a lot and communicate to their friends. Lifetime has a school marm with no money, so don't advertise with them is the kind of broader point. Um, this would be Crypto Kids, which is a program created by the NSA in the DC metropolitan area and the suburbs surrounding it to try and not only encourage kids to have a imaginary about becoming a future NSA agent or cryptographer, but also to identify particular skills that might want, they may want to track towards becoming a cryptographer or NSA agent. Um, Cindy Katz has pointed to the situated experiences of youth as significant factors in the reproduction of global industrial capitalism in places as disparate as rural Sudan and New York City. Stuart Ewan, meanwhile, has theorized the significance of youth as an industrial ideal that provided an idiom for the social norms, desires, practices, and ideologies necessary to reproduce industrial capitalism within the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century. Presupposed by its industrial manifestation, informationalism operates in the embodied sorry, operates in the embodied and situated experiences of young people, as well as through disembodied and idealized cultural stereotypes of youth. Youth emerges a cultural ideal in advertisements and legislation, as well as parenting and pedagogical practices that encourages a society to give up its industrial era notions of privacy, property, and security, and to adopt new notions that facilitate an informational mode of development. Cultural stereotypes of eager young consumers unconcerned about privacy, young prey stalked by cyber bullies and online predators, or young criminals stealing intellectual property help maintain and reproduce certain modes of production and consumption in the life spaces of youth, not to mention their parents and educators. So this led to a participatory uh, action research project, the action being the design element, called MyDigitalFootprint.org, where I put together a team of five youth co-researchers who called themselves the Youth Design and Research Collective. The initial goal was pretty simple. I wanted to interview young people living in New York City that wanted to talk about their relationship with the internet and sort of plumb them for ideas around the, the notions of privacy, property, and security. What do these words mean to them? What it, how does it shape their online experiences? The interviews rarely, if ever, used these actual words, but these were the topics and the things I was trying to talk about and get some information um, about. And the goal throughout the whole process was that I was going to start with interviewing young people um, to get their ideas and figure out what I did and did not know. And the next step was going to be to hire five of those interviewees as co-researchers, um, pay them a wage, not a particularly good one, but a wage nonetheless, um, and then involve them in the IRB application, the process of doing research with me, and to collaboratively build an open source social network, 
right? Our goal was not to create some rival to Facebook. Our goal was simply to see if we could do it and what we could learn through the process of actually producing a social network instead of simply consuming it, right? So trying to take the classic social network consumer and putting them in the position of producer to see what kinds of knowledges opened up and to see what kind of consciousness may have been arised. Um, so I recruited people online, offline. I can talk about this more in the questions. I'm not sure you are all terribly interviewed by that, um, terribly in, uh, interested in that. One of the interviewees in this process, when asked, when asked to talk at the very end of each interview, I would specifically say the three words, privacy, property, and security, and ask for them just to respond to those words. Again, at the very end of the interview, after we had already talked about everything and I was not leading them in this direction, I just wanted to get a very direct response to what those words mean to them, if anything. 16-year-old uh, Whitney made this statement. Uh, I think all those words are related to each other too because you have to, even though you want to still be private, you still want to be secure about the stuff that you're now private with and you want other people to know that's your property so don't touch it. Or you want to be aware of other people's property so you know not to touch it or violate it um, in any way. And it speaks to the idea that they have a sophisticated understanding that online information is at once prop legal property of either theirs or someone else's, and yet it also has to do with privacy and security policies. So the confluence or the, the interaction of these three terms, while they don't have a, a terribly deep understanding of it, they're aware of it and they're thinking about this in relation to how they use digital media on a regular basis. Let's skip this for a moment. Um, so I did 15 two-hour interviews, roughly two hours. They were semi-structured, very in-depth, trying to understand what they were talking about and what their concerns and interests were in relation to these three concepts. Uh, 11 of the 15 young people interviewed expressed interest in participating as youth co-researchers in the design team that I was putting together. Uh, thanks to a small research grant that I had, I could afford to hire eight of these researchers over a six-month period. Um, out of those, sorry, I lost my place. Um, out of those eight that were off, formally offered the position, five, six accepted and attended an orientation, five of which continued after the orientation. Um, I wish I could tell you why people did not participate, but it, that was the people I did not get information from. So we can speculate, but it's hard to totally nail down why some did and why some did not. Um, it was important that these be paid positions, uh, not only to compensate these young people for their participation, but also to value their expertise monetarily. And I'm not trying to make an argument that that's the only way one can honor expertise. Um, but that if we're talking about the way in which they are providing highly valuable labor to Facebook or other social networks that then use that labor in turn to improve their products, it, there was something important about valuing and actually paying for their time to design and develop a social network itself. Um, the YDRC could then reflect on the ways their own human environment interactions were being valued within the project and how this compared with other ways their interactions were or were not being valued in proprietary ecologies. Um, I'm going to skip this as well. One of the big takeaways from the interviews that I did with teenagers prior to convening the research and design team um, was this highly scientific graph, right? That I had very rich qualitative data of young people talking uh, extensively about the hardware they're using, the software they're using, the brands and programs that they like, but once it got to how the internet itself worked, how things got from point A to point B, it was really just a magical space of unicorns and rainbows and clouds. There was no idea that production was actually going on, almost entirely unconscious of that element, despite how rich and detailed this particular element of their everyday interactions were. And of course, this plays into part of the production that we're all um, participating in in a global economy, right? This kind of rough sketch of a map, you are using and interacting with your tools on the subway in New York City. 
Um, that has been produced halfway across the world in a manufacturing facility, perhaps in China or another country. Um, and then the data that results from that interaction is being accumulated in places like Bluffdale, Utah, where the NSA has built a million square foot data center to retain lots of this information. Um, so you can see that the geography sort of breaks down the production process so that the only thing you're actually directly experiencing is that interaction between you and the phone or you and the computer. And this is very different different and separated and spread far apart. So you can see keeping this completely mystified leads to very few questions about what's going on here or here when you're enjoying what's happening here. Right? And so opening up these questions with young people became very important to understand more was going on than the immediate interaction that they were participating in. Um, so mystified production loves the fantastical space between. Right? It keeps people unaware, unaware and unclear of what's going on. If in order to pick up your McDonald's, you had to actually walk through the slaughterhouse to get there, most of us would rethink that. And I say that as a mediator, not in some holy higher than thou position. Um, of course, kids are not helpless or hapless or totally unintelligible about all of these things. Uh, many of the interviewees describe themselves as more capable of negotiating their privacy, property, and security than their teachers, and especially their parents, and especially their parents. Disclosures of managing a parent's engagement with the internet to ensure a certain degree of personal privacy were, were most common, as in this example from 14-year-old Orlando. So this is a case in which Orlando, speaking about his privacy in a general sense, says, well, like my mom is kind of annoying how she like, like she's a great person, but how sometimes when she gets on Facebook, she'll just start clicking. So if she sees anything that I've been tagged in, she'll click on it and she'll go through the whole album. So what I did was I went on her when she went to the bathroom and she was on Facebook and I went on there and I went into my profile and I said hide all posts so I don't think she can see it. But I asked her, would you be mad if I defriended you? And she'd be like, yeah. But it's so obvious if you block someone, it's even just like defriending them, right? Now, Facebook's policies have changed a bit since this happens. So we may not have to have been as cunning, but the idea here is that they have very sophisticated ways about protecting their privacy, suggesting a very deep concern about their own privacy, at least in relation to specific tangible people like their parents or their teachers or their principals, but nowhere in this imaginary or this equation are other factors that might be considered. Um, so I'll move forward a little bit to some of the, this was the YDRC themselves, the five young people ranging in ages from 15 to 19 that participated in the project and participated in designing and developing the social network uh, in light of analyzing these interviews. If I didn't make it clear previously, when I engaged these young people, uh, we collaboratively evaluated the interviews that I had done as a whole with, 20, uh, with 15 other young people. Um, and our goal was to identify concerns and interests they had and build a social network that reflected those concerns and interests in some meaningful way. That was really our only goal and task. The rest was to be de uh, designed by them. So we did a number of activities together. We created an interview vlog where they had questions that we were unable to directly answer through our own research or that were not particularly answerable, that were very subjective and going to get different answers depending on who we asked. So we recorded two questions each out of these 10 kind of big questions that were still left uh, unanswered. And I tried to line up as many internet experts, IP lawyers, people that produced games for online companies, um, academics, uh, people working in government, people working at ICANN, people from different aspects of the internet to give the same answers to the same question, which of course turned out to be very different answers to the very same question. Um, and we took this into our own research and into our own thinking. Questions were things like this. What role do you think the internet plays in how young people think and act? As well as how and why is it that our online information is never fully deleted from the internet? What a lawyer is going to tell you about protecting yourself as a corporation, thus storing all data, is going to be different than someone who is an information architect and is going to give more of this is how the system is designed by default to create redundancy and thus data gets copied onto different servers. So very different answers to the same question depending on these people's backgrounds. Um, this ultimately led to the design of the social network itself using WordPress and BuddyPress which gave us an open source, out of the box uh, social network that we could essentially configure, produce, design, and develop. One of the first things we did 
together was access the .po file. This is normally the language file, so if you're switching between English, French, Spanish, or so forth, it changes all the default text in um, the social network itself. And while we weren't trying to convert it from English to something else, we were trying to challenge the actual rhetoric in the interface and what it was communicating and not communicating, right? So when they realized that, that at the production level that they were at, there was no such thing as private messaging, because private messages sent through the social network would be visible to them on the production end, they decided to change that to public messaging, right? So these sort of subtle shifts in terms of what is being communicated to us through the interface that we know does no, no longer jives with what we're seeing on the back end, right? Uh, the social profiles themselves became essentially our interviews for other young people to come to the social network and participate by identifying concerns that they had, interests they had. Um, and so the sheer act of designing a social profile and understanding that these are moral and ethical and political decisions made on the back end, that it's not some natural phenomena that they're interacting with, was a consciousness-raising activity as was the fact that we needed to create a terms of use policy for the social network itself. Because the social network was part of a research project sanctioned by the CUNY Graduate Center's Institutional Review Board, um, the terms of use had to count as an assent form that someone under the age of 18 would be able to consent to. Right? So we had to adhere to all of these IRB restrictions, like it can't be longer than a page, it has to be re re readable in 10 minutes or so, really kind of narrowed it down. I'm really going to speed ahead because I've spent a lot of time on this first project. So we ended up with this kind of comparison, right? This was our terms of use policy, and this was the terms of use policy that Facebook ended up creating, right? Or uh, that routinely puts us in touch with. This is not something that can be read. And so going through that process made them realize if we were able to articulate what we're doing with data in relation to um, what the IRB says is ethical, why is it that Facebook with teams of lawyers cannot communicate it to us in a way that we understand, right? In part because they have different objectives. This is to limit liability, right? It's not to clearly articulate to the user what's going on with their data. Um, so to speed up a bit, just so I can at least touch on the course that I was talking about or wanted to get to. Um, so Settlement House as Technosocial Interface is another idea that I want to put out there. Um, this is a course that I organized through the New Media and Digital Design program at Fordham that partners with a local settlement house on the Upper West Side in which students both take three hours, a uh, three-hour course a week, the course itself being called Designing Smart Cities for Social Justice, where we try to read through the smart city literature and imagine who is and who is not being reflected in this new emerging smart city, um, while they're also spending three hours a week uh, participating at the local um, Lincoln Square Neighborhood Center, right? And this center is a settlement house, which is slightly different than a community center, in part because this one is attached to two public housing developments, Amsterdam Houses and Amsterdam Edition, and the settlement house itself as a model drawn from um, Jane Addams and the Hull House in Chicago would be maybe the most famous from the industrial era, is that it strengthens individual and neighborhood assets and builds collective capacity to address community problems, right? So they deal with things like how to keep elderly um, inhabitants of the public housing projects, allow them to age in place, get them in touch with social services, get kids into after school programs. It tries to treat the whole life of the community and offer a multitude of services. Um, our pedagogical influences in the class were primarily things going on at the Public Science Project, Detroit Digital Justice, as well as the Red Hook Initiative here in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to move through this. The end result of the semester's work of being embedded in this settlement house week after week while we're also dealing with literature often operating at a higher level was trying to understand what people at the settlement house were saying they wanted and they needed in relation to this emerging digital economy, right? And the discussion was most strong among senior citizens there who kept articulating and coming up to the students, asking them for different kinds of assistance with technology in the computer lab. They had someone that was in the computer lab, but not someone that was running kind of structured workshops. So they decided to follow the Disco Tech pamphlet that Detroit Digital Justice put out to organize a week of workshops that'll start next week all of which w the subject was designed or picked by local participants in the settlement house and the students will be running it there in the lab 
at the end of these workshops, they'll transition into focus groups to begin a discussion about what other kinds of digital support do they feel their community needs in order to remain a full, uh, fully recognized citizen of the smart city. Um, so I think what's sort of come out of this whole experience in the service learning course is the idea that the settlement house, rather than the new media district, is a potentially potent techno-social interface that queers neoliberal modes of knowing and belonging for communities marginalized in and by the emerging urban platform. And so I'm not going to go into this other than introduce it in case we want to talk about it later. This has fed into a comparative ethnography of the two neighborhoods, right? One which is the Amsterdam houses that surround the settlement house, and one is the Hudson Yards, which is further south. This being sort of pitched as the premier new media district, the model kind of smart neighborhood, smart home, um, and this as an industrial holdover of what Robert Moses did with um, the I think it was the New Urban Act. Um, the, yeah, sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the act that Moses used. But when he cleared that area, which was primarily one of New York City's largest African-American neighborhoods, now the, what, there, what remains of diversity in terms of both economic diversity as well as racial diversity is highly concentrated within these two public housing projects. And so trying to see how the development of this with a whole lot of public funds um, is not being met with the development of this neighborhood on Manhattan's west side. I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, I, it's, we're going to open it up to questions now. I, does anyone, would anyone like to ask anything? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a lot of information to process. Um, I'm just going to focus on the uh, providing of free internet access. Mm -hmm. And my question is um, from a social exchange theory point of view. And how do you view the relationship between the marginalized group versus the companies that are providing this access? Because from a social exchange point, uh, point a social exchange point of view, it's not necessarily that a companies are extracting uh, value from this, but that they are also providing it. So it's a mode of exchange rather than extraction. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not trying to stand up here and, and demonize, I guess, Facebook or Google with these kinds of projects, but I would ask, why are they interested in doing this, right? These are not benevolent entities that care personally and deeply about these local cultures. They're trying to expand markets in which they compete, right? So when Facebook creates Internet Basics and tries to make that become the predominant point of access for lots of people in India, and then those people in India, instead of gaining access to the Internet, which it's being billed as, they really really gain access to Facebook, right? And within their proprietary ecology that they have created. So there may be value that that person gets out of it of a local population, but it doesn't seem to change the economic conditions that created that marginalization in the first place. So I would question in that exchange theory, what exactly is being exchanged? Um, I have a question. I am... Um I'm curious about um, what you think are the limits of the like like participatory action research model. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know that your that you received training from the Public Science Project and work mm -hmm. with Michelle Fine and Maria Torre, and your dissertation work was sort of like firmly grounded in that tradition. And it sounds like the Service Learning Project is also drawing from that tradition. Right, so what it's not particularly good at is generalizability, right? Mm -hmm. I make no claim that from these small teams and these very rich and kind of engaged um, documented experiences that I can make these very broad predictions about what all young people experience. That is something that quantitative science is much better and more equipped to do. Um, what I think it does do are a few other things that quantitative approaches aren't able to do. One, it helps build qualitative stories and narratives that cannot be reflected in the data itself. Right? So one thing I talk a lot about is data-driven indifference, the way in which that uh, the smart city or data gathering practices in general sort of goes around social injustice. Right? It doesn't actually address it directly. So we can have all of these discussions about 
um, building urban dashboards or state dashboards. Michigan was one of the premier states building a dashboard. Governor Snyder, um, his Twitter handle, I think, is one tough nerd, something along those lines. It's all about data will bring accountability. And yet all of that data aggregation, for as useful and good as it was, it completely missed the toxins, the... Um, the lead in the water of Flint, Michigan, right? That was not registering, and the actual narratives developed by the people affected by this were not even being listened to. So what I like about PAR is that it engages the people that are being left out of the more traditional kinds of knowledge production, tries to give them a voice, and tries to create narratives that are being left out of the more dominant forms of knowledge production. Um. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, one of the interesting things about your project that really resonated with me was that you know settlement houses were the original sort of alternative sociological model. Mm -hmm. I would like to think so. I mean, I really, I don't know for sure. I, I would like to think so in part because if we look at New York City, by a lot of quantitative metrics, things are doing, we're going, we're, you know, things are great. Things are going well here. Yet 46% are living within 150 times the poverty threshold. That's not a particularly great statistic. And so it suggests we really need to take some serious action that that challenge, not to say that we shouldn't be doing things like the Hudson Yards, but if we're going to do that, we have to be doing things like beefing up these settlement houses or thinking about it as a model to try and account for the people that aren't being imagined as part of that smart city, right? So, um, I mean, the settlement house history as you alluded to, it went in a number of different directions. There was a co-option, there's a lot of settlement in of itself about certain people are who should be modeled and the other people are supposed to follow. So I realize there are problematic aspects of the settlement house itself, but usually I hear discussions about how we deal with things like the digital divine confined almost exclusively to schools and libraries. And I love schools and libraries, and I think they're gonna be, they should be great nodes in this new informational future, but the settlement house is just completely left out as an idea of going beyond simply education as the only model um, that we wanna hold from the industrial era. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this question, I guess, about um, time scales. One of the things that I kind of that's very noticeable in in some of the things you're looking at is that they operate like architecture doesn't really operate at like a high speed, and it doesn't fail fast. It fails like kind of slowly and systemically, and it's very kind of in contrast to the the rhetoric that's sort of being applied to smart cities and such. And I guess I'm curious in the work you're doing, kind of what time scale you see yourself operating in. Like, what is the length of your relationship? with these spaces and is like how, how you kind of think about it in terms of like your like producing the kind of transformational change you're maybe aspiring towards. Uh, slow and painful for sure. I mean, it, just taking the collaboration with the Settlement House as like a particularly good example since it's, it started but there's a sort of clear future to it. So that was one semester like a normal academic semester. It started in January, it's ending next week. But it took a full year to plan for that course, not just to get like the pedagogical stuff in place, but to meet with the uh, settlement houses, the, set the people who worked at the settlement house regularly to build some rapport, to not become this outside colonizing force that's going to march a bunch of students in to save everyone, which was by no means the, our goal or intent. But that means it's going to take much longer. It's not easy to come up with lots of flashy data that's going to, you know, attract a lot of attention. It's going to be a long, slow process. And so 
at what's now been a full year of working with them, we're now getting to the stage of saying, let's start collaborating on some grant applications so we can actually beef up our staff and start moving at a faster speed, but only because we went rather slowly over the past year. So I see it, like most PAR projects, they go on for years. And it's really not till that those last few stages that you really have like the research products and the fruits of all of that labor to put out into the public which is why the participatory component is so essential because it might take a long time to create that output, but everyone participating in it along the way is getting an actual something, an actual takeaway, right? They're learning, in the case of young people, some skills on how to create a social network. At the Settlement House, these senior citizens are learning how to navigate the web better, make use of free tools that are available to them at the center, and so forth. So it's a very long, I see them as like multi-year projects that will continue to grow and change, as it should be, because in a year, what we think of as the smart city or even Hudson Yards is going to change quite radically. So to try to see it as a problem that just exists now and I can create a solution to that is almost impossible because as you point out, it's going to go through all kinds of changes before it's actually finally completed. I don't know if that fully answered your question though. So if you want to follow up, I'm... Knowing the, um, the cycles of like finding funding for that kind of work, like what what is the, like, the process of even kind of like establishing that kind of time span of a project? Is it sort of just like, we'll just keep doing this? It's a year to year kind of piecemealing thing? Is there like multi year support kind of already built into this stuff? Like, right. I, honestly, kind of just try, trying to understand like how these sorts of projects at this scale like happen and work. Got it. Every project I've been part of sort of started very much in the piecemeal. If it was a PAR project, and then if it was not just if it was successful, but if it, if it had real kind of drive, that the goal was then to get it some more stability, right? And so with the Settlement Houses project, it's very much that point of trying to move away from this patchwork approach of just trying to keep it going and getting something that might be a more solid funding stream so we can do it as like a year-round project. But that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about the comparative ethnography that you just sort of touched on at the end? Sure, I'll actually just go back to some slides because it'll be a little easier to kind of highlight. So it's sort of these two images which I think highlight what, I, this is, uh, isn't actually, this is from their website but I cut it up, chopped it up and put it together again. So it's sort of a false presentation of what their website actually looks like. But on one hand, we're looking at a neighborhood in the Hudson Yards that had a very prominent industrial purpose, and that purpose sort of went away as the city deindustrialized, right? So it became one of these um, underutilized areas in Manhattan itself that attracted lots of attention to redevelopment. It was originally the site of like the Olympics proposal that Bloomberg was pushing. It's now become the Hudson Yards project. And on their website, what they're constantly touting is not just it's gonna be this premier new media district that will attract uh, offices from Google offices as well as creative labor from around the world, but that we're sinking $2 billion of private investment and all of this money in terms of public investment into facilitating this neighborhood itself, right? At the same time, when we go to the Upper West Side, the Amsterdam houses, we don't see much money being put into the community itself, either through the settlement house uh, as an entity or through these two public housing projects, which again, the 3,000 people living in this kind of small cluster of housing is the bulk of racial and economic diversity on the Upper West Side. And it has been so historically, right? This is a horrible image I got online, but it was the only way to sort of put it together. But those of you who saw the West Side story, Right? They did a lot of great like musical scenes in the street of the Upper West Side, and it, you might wonder, how did they get everyone to evacuate the streets? Well, Robert Moses helped them with that. Right After they evacuated everyone from this neighborhood, before creating the Lincoln Center area, they, after evacu evacuating everyone through eminent domain, um, but before raising all the buildings, they actually shot the movie in that area. So there's this very interesting history to um, what's been going on in this area during industrialism, how it was changed by Moses to, at the time, attract new capital and to fit the city into this broader global economy that was emerging, and what was left as kind of the promise to all the people evicted were able to come back were these two public housing projects that are there. So it's really trying to look at this sort of 
poorly displayed. But what you see are two different census tracts, one that overlaps with Lincoln Square um, and Fordham, and one that overlaps with the actual public housing projects. And you see things like it's only 22.8% white in this area, and the income is 62%, only, sorry, 62,000, only because it includes more than the public housing projects themselves. It would be lower if it was more tightly focused on just those few blocks. So we see a real extreme in terms of where public money is and is not going, as well as where is private capital going and not going. And it would be, I guess, a disservice to say we're putting no public money uh, into it because if we think about the enormous amount of money that we're spending on things like stop and frisk, right? We're spending enormous amounts of money on labor and technology to heavily police and restrict these areas from moving beyond their borders into the more affluent surroundings, right? So this is 2011 WMYC stop and frisk map where it mapped the number of stop and frisks in a particular area. And you, this is what they, what they call a hotspot, right? That there were 754 frisks in just 2011 alone, only two guns were confiscated. That's a 0.265% success rate. I think I mentioned close to 3,000 people live here. That's an insanely high number for such a relatively small population. And if you go anywhere around it, it drops to well below 100. We're usually talking around 50 stops compared to 750 when you go into that neighborhood. So there's intense efforts and money being spent on this particular neighborhood, but in a very, very different way than how it's being spent 30 blocks south in Hudson Yards in trying to compare what is going on here, who is allowed to belong in this new city, in this new mode of development, and who is not allowed to belong, or how are we communicating a sense of belongingness and who gets to participate and who doesn't. Hi. Um, are there any smart cities out there, whether in the U.S. or internationally, that have gotten have gotten it right as far as how to implement a smart city, or are some of these issues endemic to the smart city philosophy, or is it just very specific to New York? Um, well, one, I, I wouldn't say that even in New York that it's like all wrong, you know, or that any city is all wrong, but that it's an amalgamation of a lot of competing interests, right? So there's a lot right going on in New York City with these, as well as other smart cities, as well as a lot of wrong going on. Um, I haven't done enough work to do a direct comparison about what's going on in New York City to how it might happen in other areas, but examples I found about particularly successful smart cities, um, or I've also done work on, um, gated communities, which are also entirely private incorporated communities, where they seem to work best is where you're dealing with a, major a mostly affluent community or area, where resources are plentiful, you don't need to worry about the marginalized community or where there's a lack of capital. It's when there's already intense, from what I'm seeing, intense segregation and intense inequality that it doesn't seem to do much to change the conditions that created that. Right, so while it can do many, many wonderful things, it's not actually addressing the root of the problem itself, which I guess is more my critique, instead of trying to suggest that it's wholesale bad. Mm -hmm. Gregory, thank you so much for coming to visit us at Data and Society. It was a pleasure having you here, and it's been fascinating to learn about um, the way that your work is developing. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>